Laura Lippman has written 25 novels from Baltimore Blues in 1997 up until 2023's Prom Mom, which is difficult for an English person to say. We'd say mum, you say mum, don't you? Twelve of these feature the private investigator Tess Monaghan, although not Prom Mom. Uh, Laura has won Agatha, Anthony, Edgar, Nero, Gumshoe, and Seamus Awards. There are probably others along the line as well. And she was a, a, a journalist, a working journalist for 20 years, including on the Baltimore Sun. And while she writes fiction, her works are, or well, some of them, grounded in fact. Thank you so much for being here today. And, and one of those books is Prom Mom as well. Just tell us a bit about where the inspiration so this came from. I'll be, always be very frank about this. It came from a podcast, one I like very much, called You're Wrong About. That was originally Sarah Marshall and Michael Hobbs. It's now just Sarah Marshall again. Sarah is someone who's sort of made a career for herself as a journalist writing about women who have been more or less vilified in the press. She started with a long piece about Tanya Harding. And I almost called it a shtick, but that's not fair. The process for her is to look at this story that you think you know everything about and just sort of deconstruct the misogyny in the way these women were treated. So she started with Tanya Harding. Um, it's, it's a great podcast, and this would have been peak pandemic. I'm walking all the time, so I'm listening to podcasts all the time. And... They were the ones who called it prom mom, kind of recognizing it. That was probably a literal tabloid headline in the States for one of the cases. But, and I knew the cases that they referred to. I, I was vaguely familiar with them. And like everyone else, I was kind of wrong about them. And the thing, though, that came kind of singing out into my little earbuds and almost literally stopped me in my tracks was this very offhand comment by Sarah about how skeptical people are when girls in the situation might say they didn't even know they were pregnant. And she said, oh, sure, because the teenage girls are so in touch with their bodies. And I thought, you know what, she's right. I can imagine a story in which a smart girl, and I wanted it to be a smart girl, could for whatever reasons be in so much denial about what was happening to her that even in an era, the 1990s, where abortion was readily available and very safe, might hesitate and might miss the opportunity to terminate the pregnancy and find herself in this situation. And then I was just like, okay, who do you become? What becomes of that person? How do they remake their life? You know, I'm very interested in the idea of how does anyone in modern times, with all of us walking around with these little massive computers in our pockets, how do you hide in plain sight? How do you get another chance? And it was very deliberate that I said, okay, this character has to have a name that makes finding her hard. So Amber Glass, I mean, I literally tried this out. If you put Amber Glass in a Google search, you're going to be besieged with these shopping sites for antique depression era glassware. So I liked that. And also, you know, the idea of glass transparency when this is a character who's anything but transparent about what she's doing and what she wants. But I was also really interested in the idea that there's no prom dad. The, the boys in the situation are usually kind of held harmless. Although one of the stories that was covered in the podcast, the boy was a very active participant in, in the homicide. I mean, this is very deliberate, and they were two college-age students. In most of the cases, the boy isn't there, doesn't, maybe doesn't know, certainly hasn't encouraged any, you know, it's just sort of held blameless. And so the boy gets to go off and have a pretty unvarnished life, untarnished, I guess that's the word I'm looking for. So all of those things were interesting to me. And at the time, I feel like at the time we're talking about, I would have conceived this book in 
2021, if that sounds right, yeah. yeah. Um, there were two kinds of writers at this time. There were people who said, whatever I do, I'm not going to write about the pandemic. No one wants to read about it. I hate living through it. My, I'm very good friends with the spectacularly talented Megan Abbott. And Megan and I had this discussion, and she said, you know, if you think about it, my books aren't really set in any time. I'm never specific about year. There might be a couple of clues like cell phones or not, but there is a timelessness to what Megan does, which is part of what makes her brilliant. And then there were writers who were like, I don't know what else to write about. And I was very much like, I don't know how to write about anything but this. And this book, it, it time shifts, doesn't it? And it, it, it shape shifts as well. And how did you, how did you put it together? How did you structure it? Well, tell us about the structuring of it. So I'm one of these people, and I hope to write an essay about this one day. I'm really big on making rules just for myself. And this is in my life and in every book that I write, there's going to be a principle, a rule. And I decided very early on, because I knew this is a book with some surprises. Yeah. I'm really big on playing fair, even though I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if a couple of readers are like, at the end of this book, like, what? <laughs> Wait a minute. But, so I decided early on that it would have this bookend of the day that this horrible thing happens would be at the beginning and at the end. And there are three principles. Amber, who's the girl who baby died the night of the prom and she was charged with its death. Joe, her date, who is utterly oblivious to the fact that his date is pregnant. And the woman to whom he is now very happily married, Meredith, whom he met in college and, and in whom he has t confessed everything long ago and in who is almost a saint of a person who has sort of assigned herself the task of helping her husband Joe be the best man he can be and sort of offered him redemption through her love. So you have these three people and the primary part of the structure is we see them on certain days and you have to see all three of them and you have to see the day through their POV and sometimes it overlaps and they're having different experiences even in the same scene but it's like we're going to check in with all three of them on these very set dates and sort of just see how they're moving through the story. But I also wanted to provide these little snapshots of the teenage couple through third parties. Yes. So, you know, we find out how Joe's mother feels about her precious son dating this girl that she doesn't think is anywhere good enough for him. You see the point of view of the limo driver who took them to the prom, <laughs> which is actually I interviewed a limo driver Did that you? I knew. <laughs> oh, yeah, he was amazing. And he, you know, um, you see a journalist who's writing about Amber shopping for her prom dress, which is actually based on me. It's on you. That it? was a story I did back in the 90s. My editor had this idea of doing these like really kind of micro stories about spring rituals. Yeah. And she's like, go shopping for a prom dress. And I went shopping with the nicest girl in the world, and her mother was nothing like Amber's mother, to be sure. So I, I kind of wanted those little slivers so you could be reminded of who Amber was and who Joe was and the promise and potential that they had. And then one of them loses it all and one of them loses really nothing. Yeah. You know, he takes a year off. He doesn't go to college right away. He goes to a very different kind of college than he planned on going to. But then he meets the love of his life, Meredith. So, and, and whose family leads him into this very lucrative job in, in yeah. commercial real estate. They've got an amazing life, haven't yeah. they? Just the description of their house is beautiful, yeah. isn't yeah, it? Yeah, they're living very well. And you know, Meredith is a plastic surgeon who does charitable missions to Guatemala and is just, you know, seemingly beyond reproach. And, you know, it, no one in this book is beyond reproach, as it turns out. I don't think that's a spoiler. 
But I was, uh, you know, I love James Cain. He's one of my all-time favorite writers. He was a Baltimore journalist. He mm-hmm. worked at the Baltimore Sun, where I worked. But I've always been fascinated by how fast Cain gets things going. Postman always rings twice. Yeah. Like, they're having sex in the first chapter, and then it's like, we're going to have to kill your husband. Double indemnity. They're having sex in the first chapter, and it's like, we're going to have to kill your husband. And, <laughs> you should come up with another first chapter, shouldn't you? I mean, it, it's... They're good first good books, and uh, yeah. fa- I mean, these are amazing books, and I said, can I do... And I had already sort of done one take on Kane when I wrote a book called Sunburn, and my idea was, like, a beautiful stranger comes to town, but it's a woman this time, and she has a very big secret. And so I was like, can I do double indemnity where the reader knows from jump? I mean, the reader knows from the first time we see Amber and Joe in the present day that Amber has not forgotten this man and that she's clearly still thinking about him and that she's, I don't like to say like a moth to a flame because it's just a terrible cliche, do you know Amber and Joe are going to meet up again? And I think most readers know what's eventually going to happen, eventually. And I'll admit, oh gosh, I feel almost so guilty about this. So I had a friend who was having an affair during the pandemic. And the friend shared with me the detail of how they would park in the parking lot of of the Starbucks and how you have to have one car facing in and one car facing out so that the two driver side windows are next to each other and you can roll them down and talk that way. Like this is like during the height of the pandemic where you wouldn't even get into each other's cars maybe. I stole that detail. That's like one of the things, that's where you're definitely into the Joan Didion territory. You're always, you know, you're always selling someone out as a writer. But I, yeah, I was really interested in all of that. And you, you were a, obviously a journalist for many, many years. In what ways do you think that informed every, all your writing? And there was obviously a bit of overlap as well, I think, wasn't there for the four or five years, maybe? Seven years. Seven, seven years. books while working full time as a reporter. Wow. So I'm really interested in facts. I'm really interested in what people do for a living. Um, I'm really interested in how things work. I will say that one of the big differences between being a full-time novelist and being a novelist who's working as a journalist is that my life is a little more insular now. You know, I used to sit in a big newsroom full of colleagues who knew everything and who were so there to help me when I would like, you know, like literally I could go to a colleague and say, if I went to visit someone who was on then death row in Maryland, we don't have it anymore. Would I talk to them through a glass on a phone, like I've seen in the movies? And like, they're like, no, it's so interesting. They just let you sit in a room with the guy. Wow, you just sit on a table <laughs> with the serial killer. One, one of my friends told me that he had gone to interview someone who was a killer, but had been had had good enough behavior in prison that he had a lot of freedom. And he's like, so we were in one room, and we're told, oh, no, we need this room. So I'm just wandering the prison with this killer. And everywhere we go, people are like, hi, Butch. How you doing? Like, you know, so, I, you know, but I've always been interested in how things work. I re- I really fascinated by work itself. So that's why I think the other thing as a reporter, and I bet you'll get this, is that people who haven't been reporters um, are not uh, efficient at research. And they can go down these huge rabbit holes. And I know how to research to task. And I sort of get everything in place before I start looking for expertise. And generally, when you're talking to someone with a somewhat, I wouldn't say rare, but you know, someone who has a job that most people don't know very much about. The detail that will jump out at you is nothing big ever, but it's so real. So you get the limo driver telling me that he always could tell who was a good kid and who was a bad kid. How could he tell? Um, by the way they interacted with him, yeah. by their manners. Like he's like, you know, I had parents who would carry a cooler full of 
alcoholic beverages down to my car and like wink at me and I'm like oh no 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 I don't do that that's illegal and it, it just he was he was just so sure of his ability yeah. to tell the good kid from the bad kid and and I said and if the kids want to fool around in the car he goes yeah I just take a walk and have a smoke he was very I mean of all the details of all the years I've been doing this I think one of the best days and I actually spent like three hours in the store of a furrier because I was writing about a furrier in one of the early Tess Monaghan novels. And this is what I never would have predicted. When women came in to store their furs for the hot weather months, he saw that as an enormous opportunity for an upsell. So he would say to the woman, and did you enjoy your coat this winter? And if she said, no, I hardly wore it at all, he would see that as an opportunity to convince her to buy a newer, more expen a new, more expensive coat on the grounds that you're not wearing this because you don't like it. What you need is, I love details like that. I live for details like that. You would never think, and the things that you would never think about that are almost every day when you see these things and you pull up a stone and you see that world underneath. And you yes. Think that, oh, that life there, or the, whatever it happens to be, is fascinating. You... Um, I wrote um, five years ago now, The Lady uh, in the Lake, which is out on Apple Plus this year. Coming is out it? July 19th. They just announced it, yeah. And that was inspired by, you know... Two your, very true crimes. True crimes. Tell us about them and how you were able to bring that to work as a work of fiction. I grew up in Baltimore, I'm the as I've already mentioned, I'm the daughter of a newspaper man. So I was like a weird little 10-year-old who was reading the newspaper. And the two crimes in question actually took place in 1969. One was uh, the just unspeakable, unthinkable murder of an 11-year-old girl. And that case was covered in the newspaper and I read about it every day and I knew everything about it. That's Esther Lebovitz? Yes. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. Flash forward 20 years. I'm now a reporter at the Baltimore Sun. And there's, you know, he's, he's great. He was almost like the cliche of a newspaper man from the movies. Um, there was a, a rewrite man named David Etlin. He sort of had his own Baltimore tour. And he would show us. Druid Hill Park, which is where the zoo is in Baltimore, and had, had I think it's gotten rid of it, had this enormous fountain, and he would said that's where they found the lady in the lake, thinking himself very clever for having used the Raymond Chandler. And that was a black woman, Shirley Parker, whose body was found there only after a complaint about the electric lights being out. Her autopsy never established a cause of death, so she wasn't even officially a homicide. And while her disappearance had been noted by the weekly Afro-American, a newspaper published primarily for the black community in Baltimore, there was no mention of her disappearance until she was found dead. And if she hadn't been found dead where she was found dead, we'd never know anything about her at all. And so I... I was really interested in that contrast, the white child who had so much attention paid and the black woman about whom even I, little newspaper junkie, knew nothing. Um, I moved the story to 1966 because I considered that to be a more interesting and pivotal year in the 60s. It's like before everything gets, like 69 things are already, we've had Woodstock, we've had the um, incidents at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. There's, there's more of a sense of the country fraying and falling apart. And it turns out 66 is a very pivotal year in the history of Baltimore policing. It is the year that black officers for the first time will be allowed to do anything other than walk patrol or work vice. It's the year of a governor's race that had uncanny parallels to the 2016 presidential race in which you had an experienced kind of conventional politician running against a racist outsider, only the racist outsider was a Democrat. There were all these things happening in 66, but 
I'm really aware of myself and what I do. And as someone who has been inspired by true crimes, I think a lot about what I owe to the victims and the families of those crimes, if anything, because I'm inspired by them, but I'm not writing about them. But that's a distinction that might not be meaningful to someone who's lived with an incredible, yes. painful crime in their life. And this wasn't the first time I'd done this, but this time I really went full at it, which is, it's like, I'm going to go full meta, and I'm going to write a story about a white woman who pursues her ambition by writing about the death of a black woman. That's what Lady in the Lake is about. And it's about this one woman who has sort of recovered long dormant ambitions. You know, it had a very traditional and conventional life as a housewife and a mother. Now that son's about to go to college. Now she's, through a chance encounter with an old friend, sort of been reminded of who she meant to be. And she launches herself like a missile through the Baltimore of 1966. And the reason she decides to investigate the death of this black woman is because nobody else cares. She's a clerk at the newspaper, and they're like, sure, let her work on that in her spare time because no one else is going to work on that story. It's not an important story. And I wanted to show this careerist woman who is so interested and focused on this one story that as she goes careering through Baltimore, she meets almost 20 people who she doesn't bother to think about their stories. It's like, you know, if you want to be a human interest reporter, maybe be interested in humans. And that's the lesson that Maddie has to learn. And so it does have this very unusual structure where while the two major points of view are, well, first of all, the dead woman. The dead woman opens the book. And that's one of those things as a writer where you talk about serendipity. It was like Billy Wilder's birthday or something. And everybody's talking on social media about Billy Wilder. I was like, well, Sunset Boulevard begins with a dead man talking to us. I don't see why my book can't begin that way. And, you know, they're, if you're going to steal from people, which I do recommend, Billy Wilder's a really good person to steal from. I, I will just go on this um, tangent very briefly and say that I've thought a lot about it. And I don't think I could do a desert island disc or book. But if I'm stuck on a desert island with the films of only one director, yeah. Billy Wilder, because you have everything. Exactly. You know, he, did, he had such a broad range. I mean, especially if you can get one, two, three with James Cagney. <laughs> so, um, but there are all these little points of view. It's like you, you see Maddie talking to someone. And then you get to go inside that person's head for three to four pages. And every single one of them has a story that she's failed to see. They're, people are black, people are white. They're from different social caste. Um, two of them are real. Two of them are real life people. Um, the first female homicide detective in Baltimore who was a black woman and uh, the Baltimore Oriole, Paul Blair, which was the one I agonized the most ever. Like, this is like, you just don't go. He's like a hometown hero. And I would go online and find any video I could of him talking and like really try to, can I get the cadence of his voice? Can, yeah. I, can I really capture? Because to be a star athlete in 1966, the money was still pretty modest. Mm -hmm. And the, the connection to your fans was much less, um, it, was really, it was not at arm's length. I mean, these guys would go out and sit in the parking lot and, and sign baseballs for kids. So, but I really wanted to write about that. And it was interesting when it was adapted for film, I tend to, I tend to take a hands-off approach. I've only had... This is only the second project I've had to cross the finish line, but I have two more things in development. I'm about to go out on a pitch this summer. I generally say, look, I'm here if you need me. You can ask me any questions. But I was like, I don't need to be involved. This needs, I like, really, it's like, this is yours now. Please make it yours, because I think that's how that adaptation should work. And the filmmakers came to me and they said, in 
in the limited series, we need Cleo to be a much bigger character. And I said, and, and they initially said, are there things about the real life person who inspired this? Are there things about her life? And I said, we actually know very little about her life, but I said, even though it's condensed, even though it's compressed, let me just remind you of everything we find out about Cleo in this book. Yes. And you will be able to build on that. It's like it's true in terms of page count. Mm -hmm. Cleo has much, although she, she owns the beginning and the ending of the book, which is a very important choice to me, that to give the book to the victim, to not, to not let Maddie have the last word. I said, but if you, if you look into these little condensed chapters, you find out so much about her, and you can build out from there. And they really did. I mean, they have created an entire... I mean, and they've gone beyond what's in the book, which, again, is fantastic. Yes. Um, and it's important to get it right, isn't it? You know, for for because I guess she's not around anymore. Yeah. Any, anymore and for her family and for the people uh, what, just think of all the many many interactions she would have had on a weekly basis and so she would just through her own right be an institution yeah. so we call Baltimore Smaltimore and okay. my family the tradition sort of fell away during the pandemic but um, we used to always have a 4th of July party because we have a great viewing spot on top of our home for fireworks and someone who came every year was a man named Scoochie. <laughs> um, Scoochie was the brother of Fran, who was married to Donnie. And Donnie would be known, I think, in the UK. He inspired Omar and the Wire. Okay. Yeah. So this is, and, and so one year I'm sitting in our 4th of July party. It was probably in 2017 when I just started Lady in the Lake. And I'm talking to Scucci, and he said, I knew her. And he told me this story about zipping up her dress when she was getting ready to go to a party. And I took that, and I used it in the book. Flash forward to, now I have to do the math. I think it would have been 2022. I was doing an event for a different book at the library in Baltimore. And her son stood up and said, you wrote about my mother. You did not come to talk to my family. How do you justify that? And I said, I don't. I, I said, I've really been thinking a lot about the ethics of working on stories that are inspired by true crimes. I said, I will tell you the reason I don't try to talk to the families who are, are connected to these cases is because I feel that if I come to you I'm asking permission, and you should not be put in that position. And I said, when I was younger and a little more callow, I would have said I don't require permission. And that's the part of my thinking that's evolving, which is there's probably a way to reach out to families and say, I am inspired by this tragic thing that has happened to your family. There are thematic possibilities in it that interest me. I will not be writing about your loved one. I will not be writing about your family. I will be making someone up. And I think, I think it's notable that the two books I've written since Lady in the Lake have no real life component. Not, no, definitely not. But at the same time, I, I do think this is an issue that in the 25 years I've been writing has been changed so much by social media. I mean, we're sitting here, it's May 2024, and I have watched and followed everything that's happened as a consequence of Baby Reindeer on Netflix. Mm -hmm. And I'm fascinated by it. I'm, I'm particularly fascinated because the UK has so many more protections usually for people in terms of their identity and stories. You know, the U.S. is just the wild, wild west. It's like if it's public record, it's public record. Tough for you. But, you know, that's, you know, now we've reached the point where a victim tells 
a fictionalized version of his own story, and people on the internet can't stop there and won't stop there. So we all, we can say, oh, please don't do that, as he did. But we now know that the reality of using real life cases, even as just a spark of inspiration, could cause harm. And I mean, I've changed so much on this. I, I mean, years ago, I, I remember I used to say, you know, people would say, did you talk to the family before this happened? And I'd say, there are two answers about this, two answers, and one is about what a nice person I am, and one is about what a not nice person I am. And I would talk about, I didn't want to put the family in the position of granting me permission. Mm -hmm. I felt like that was just unkind, and I still feel that way. But at the same time, I was like, I don't need permission. I'm a novelist. And like, I have a harder time holding on to this. I don't feel like I require permission, but I do feel like as a human being, I need to be thoughtful about how my work could affect a living person. And I, we just, just have to definitely keep it in mind. And you know, the, we do keep it in mind all the time, as in the fact that I would never write anything that could hurt or embarrass my teenage daughter, right? So like if I'm extending that protection and kindness to my own daughter, should I not extend it to most people? I mean, obviously this changes when we're talking about, you know, if we're talking about someone, oh, I'll just say this name because he's dead. I wouldn't feel that way about O.J. Simpson. If I wanted to write a fictionalized story about O.J. Simpson, no problem. But except the problem is, is that what about Nicole Brown Simpson? Like, how do you, like, everybody's connected. I am, I really do believe that fiction offers an opportunity to have empathy for victims that is actually greater in some ways in some ways, it, it depends. It, you know, I've got this whole spiel about, because I'm a former newspaper reporter, when you read your local newspaper and there's a story about a crime, and you're reading the local newspaper, you're actually looking for a moment of disengagement. This won't happen to me because. And, and that is a rational way to read the news. I like to write novels about people that are very much like the people I imagine my readers to be. I will tell you about Prom Mom. This is gonna, if you could guess what the most controversial scene in the book was, the scene that my editor twice asked me to reconsider having in it, it was the description of Meredith's book club. Really? <laughs> yeah, see? You're kidding. Yeah, because I think they felt I was mocking and alienating my own readers. Your own readers, so you, so you don't want to sort of, yeah, and, But I don't feel like I people. was mocking and alienating no. my own readers. I was mocking book clubs. I wasn't even mocking book clubs. No. I was actually providing, I've been in book clubs. I have visited many book clubs. I was providing a pretty factual yeah. <laughs> rendition of a certain kind of book club. But I want, I feel like in fiction, we have... Um, the option to make readers a teeny bit squirmy and self-aware. And one thing I've been talking about recently with a good friend who's a writer is we're both fascinated in the nonfiction realm. I cannot resist a grifter story. And I think part of it is that the stakes are usually kind of low and no one gets killed. Yeah. But also, and we were saying, I can't, resist this because I know that I could be grifted. I absolutely know that about myself. We were, there's a wonderful um, series of podcasts in the US called The Dream. Uh, there, and then there's a book that just came out with a slightly different title. And they involve um, multi-level marketing, which is basically a pyramid scheme that doesn't have to call itself a pyramid scheme under U.S. law. I said, the only reason 
I wouldn't get taken in by a multi-level marketing scheme is because I'm too lazy. I would never do all that work. As soon as they like, you have to call 10 friends, I'd be like, I don't have 10 friends. But I do, oh God, there is, um, I won't get the name of it right. It, it was from The Ringer. A victim of a grift did a really good podcast on the grifter who was someone he met as someone trying to organize an online website for journalism, but then became a wedding planner. And he didn't mess up everybody's wedding, but he messed up a lot of weddings. And he, and he built a lot of people. And it was, it was such an unusual, to hear it from the point of view of one of the people who was his victim, but was a journalist, and then like found other victims who actually in some ways were better journalists than he was. So yeah, I love, I, I, I struggle with some, I'm not going to name it. There's a, there's a podcast in the U.S. where I feel like murder is kind of played for yucks. And I, I get so upset. And I, I don't like the Reddit detectives. There I've said it. I, I think it's a terrible thing. I mean... You're a journalist. I'm a journalist. There are skill sets. I realized we didn't have to become licensed and we're not board certified and that what we do, part of the great, I mean, I got into journalism at an early enough time that I worked alongside someone who had never gone to college who was just flat out brilliant. Yeah. But you started in small places and you learned how to do things. And I've been on the internet long enough where we've all run into people who do their own research in air quotes, and they mean they Googled something. Yeah. And they can't even, they have no literacy when it comes to the provenance of information. My thing for the podcast is the three S's. What does it tell us about society? What does it tell us about science? Or uh, in what ways has science solved the case? Or the psychology uh, as well for me. That if it doesn't hit any of those, then I'm not going to. I've I'm started interested in. dipping into your Substack, and I cannot wait to. Oh, thank you. Oh my God, I, uh, I'm always looking for good things. <laughs> ah, thank you. So, but on that on that note about crime writing, what, why do you write crime, and why do you think people are interested in reading crime? So, it's a rather um, unflattering reason about why I write crime. But back in the newsroom in Texas, so we were I'm in my 20s, and I had a colleague who said, you know, he said, you know who has a great shtick? That Tony Hillerman, he has a great shtick. He just writes novels about a detective in New Mexico. He's like, if you could figure out how to do that, you'd be set for life. So many things were wrong with that sentiment, but it really did plant the idea that, you know, that crime fiction was somehow not that hard. So wrong. Mm. But flash forward to a couple of years later, I'm now in Baltimore and I met a woman at a party and she's an editor. I don't know that. We're just two people talking at a party and she is working on a book of erotica and having a hard time getting in. She's like, you can publish under another name. So I did. And it was like my first published short story and it was with Harper Collins and I got paid more than I usually get paid, you know, 25 years later. And when we were kind of through the editing process, she was someone who had a lot of experience in crime. But what she said to me, she's like, so many women come to writing through the veil or mask of genre. They don't feel comfortable sitting down saying, I'm going to write the great American novel. But they will write a crime novel, write a romance, write a historical. And she said, you know, if you ever write a novel, Show it to me and I'll help you get it published. And I loved crime novels. Like that, I loved James Cain. I was reading Carl Hyacin at the time. I was reading Walter Mosley. I, I remember it was like I had to learn a series of lessons. I, I read Carl Hyacin and I was like, oh, you can be kind of funny writing these. And um, just an aside, I would go on to work with Carl's younger brother, Rob, to whom Lady in the Lake is, he's one of five people. It's dedicated to because he was one of the five reporters who was killed at the Annapolis Capitol Gazette in 2018. Um, and then I read Walter Mosley, and the lesson in Walter Mosley was 
the, the detective can be kind of an outsider, a self-taught outsider, a fixer. And then finally I read Sarah Paretsky and that sort of showed me the importance of even more so than Hyas and, and Mosley, who were both amazing with setting. Sort of Sarah Paretsky writing about Chicago, which is a city I knew well because I'd gone to college outside of Chicago. And I, I hate to say it because, you know, they were all there, you know, P.D. James and Sue Crafton. <laughs> but it was like, oh, and the detective can be a woman. Now I've got it. And so I was like, I can write these detective stories set in Baltimore. And so, you know, that's, I, I understood it. I understood it and I loved it. I mean, I think if I'd gone in with like sort of that calculating, oh, anyone can do this. Let me just, you know, come up with a clever plot and it's so easy. Um, so many literary writers have fallen on their swords trying to write that easy mystery novel. It, there's so many of them, I'm not gonna name names, but they all think the thing that makes it interesting is to have it be more ambiguous. Like, what if it doesn't really matter who did it? And it's just like, you really haven't read crime fiction if you think this is an original thought. But anyway, so I had a genuine love of crime fiction, but also it was sort of like, okay, this isn't grandiose, this isn't hubristic. And then once I was in it and kept going, and to my utter happiness and astonishment, ended up making a pretty good career out of it. I started looking around crime fiction and it was like, okay, you know, there's definitely crime fiction that is literary. And like, I mean, I might be limited, but my genre is not, so I don't need to leave it. And I was looking at writers like Daniel Wittrell and it just, I'm trying to, I've just gone blank on some names that are very obvious. Megan Abbott is one. And it's just like, you know what? We can do whatever we want to do with this genre. It's pretty flexible. I mean, I think that mainly the requirement is that there, it has, that the crime is the engine. Like when people, sometimes crime writers overreach and they're like, crime and punishment is a crime novel. I think not. I think crime and punishment is about something very different. They're, just because it has a crime, but if the crime is what's driving the story in any way, yes, then it's a crime novel. And it was Nick Hornby who said in his column for The Believer, I think it was, he used to write about you know what I, what I bought, what I read. This, and he was writing about Mystic River by Dennis Lehane. And he said, I, I'm paraphrasing and probably paraphrasing poorly. He said it so much better. But he said that he felt that the problem a lot of people have with the crime novel was that, he's like, do you remember school and you did arithmetic or maths? And they would say, show your work. Yeah. And if you didn't show your work, it didn't matter if you got the answer right. And he said he felt that the crime novel was a form that didn't show its work. That it wasn't, it, it wasn't there like, look at me, this is so belabored. And he said it seemed to him, and he was talking specifically about Mystic River, that if you could do everything a literary novel did and have a mystery and solve it, that it was kind of like angels dancing on the head of a pen. And of course, I love this. And Hornby would later go, go on and call me a big American cheeseburger. And it was meant well. He was like, somebody compared me to Patricia <laughs> Highsmith. Yeah. And he was like, well, you know, Patricia Highsmith is a steak and Laura Lippman's more of a big, juicy American cheeseburger. And I was like, you know, I, I think I came out of that pretty well because whoever compared me to Highsmith was really kind of over the top. You know, that's that's a bit much. But I was, you know, I was like, yeah, I'll be a big American cheeseburger. That actually sounds kind of right. So that's, you know, that's why I came to crime and that's why I stayed with it. To the question of why people are fascinated with it, well, clearly people are fascinated with puzzles. Yeah. I mean, the New York Times is now... I believe the New York Times business model is now basically 75% puzzles. I come to you this morning having done the most important part of my day, which is I've gotten to genius on spelling bee, I've done connections, and I've done strands. I don't do Wordle. That's my odd one out for whatever reason. So everyone likes puzzles. And even if it's the kind of book that sort of tells you what's happening, you still want to figure out how the hero or heroine is going to figure it out. And I think everyone's incredibly concerned with their own mortality. 
And the crime novel, I think when done right, is a novel that reminds us over and over again that in any moment, any one of us can become very unlucky because most victims are simply very, very unlucky. You know, I was here at Crime Fest and one of the panels I got to do was on Columbo, about which I am just over the top. Someone told me, they said, someone left that panel and said, I think that woman knows too much about Columbo. <laughs> but one of the stories I think about is we talked a lot about one of the greatest Columbo episodes, Murder by the Book, in which there's a character who's an inconvenient witness who is murdered very sloppily by Jack Cassidy. And that actress in real life was killed in what appeared to be a gang shooting that she was not the intended victim of. Nothing known, never solved, no leads. And that's a version of mortality that no one wants to look straight in the face. And the crime novel kind of allows us to sneak up to it. And again, we're there in our armchairs, reading at home, feeling safe and cozy. And I've said this many times, you know, when I'm, I always remind people, Hannibal Lecter, Thomas Harris's great um, creation, is a Baltimore psychiatrist. But I'm sitting in my row house in Baltimore, reading a Thomas Harris novel. I'm having a great time, but I'm not worried. I know that there's not a cannibal psychiatrist walking down my street. What I don't know is whether tomorrow is going to be the day that I see a bunch of kids from the local high school and one of them throws trash in the gutter. And for whatever reason, I go all Karen and say, don't throw trash in the gutter. And that kid has a gun and shoots me. I mean, we had an incident in Baltimore. We have something known as squeegee kids, which can be kids or men, who stand on corners and offer to clean your windshields, windscreens, um, expecting a donation. And there was a horrible incident in which a man got angry. He got out of his car with a baseball bat. He gave chase. The kid shot him and killed him. Two lives ruined at an intersection a mile from my home, not even a mile, an intersection that I certainly walk past all the time. And I do think the crime novel has this wonderful kind of sidewinder approach to empathy. Yeah. I don't want or encourage people to sit and think about every terrible thing that could happen to them if they walk out the door. That's no way to live. But I do encourage people to be reminded anything can happen to anyone at any time, which is a terrifying truism, but one we really need to embrace so that when we do meet victims, we don't blame them in any sense for what has happened to them. We just express our grief and empathy for them. That's great, thank you. I only have one more question, and it's what's next for you? I mean, Prom Mum is doing really well. You've got the uh, you've got Apple Plus coming out, the uh, Lady in the Lake in the next and, and, and few Mom months. Prom Mum has been optioned. Brilliant. Prom Mum has been optioned. Incredible. And I'm excited about that. It was it was optioned before it was published. Wow. So my next book is untitled, and interestingly, after spending a year and a half with the three characters in Prom Mum. I needed a literal and figurative vacation. And I decided to bring forward a minor character from the Tasmania handbooks, um, a now a 68-year-old widow named Mrs. Blossom, who's a woman who's trying to take a river cruise on the sun. And everyone seems to think she knows something about a stolen, long-missing Pakistani antiquity. And she says quite sensibly, Pretty sure I'd know if I had a statue of a bird in my luggage. And she's intrepid, and she's surprising, and she's utterly delightful company. It's been so long since I've written a novel and about someone in whose company I like to be. Okay. So it's untitled, but it, I'm in the final revisions for it. And when should that be out? It, I know it'll be out in the U.S. 
in June of 2025 or July, summer of 2025. Some, summer of next year. Yeah. So, and I hope my publisher Faber is interested in it. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't given them a look at it yet. So yeah. they better be. <laughs> <laughs> they better be. Brilliant, Laura Lewin. Thank you. Thank so, you so much. much. This is thank a blast. You. Oh, thank you.